Welcome to the AIS podcast. Today is a solo show and I want to go through a couple questions that I get pretty common in the, the contracting groups I'm in. And that is like when you're starting off as a contractor, what should you do? How do you even start? And it's a pretty loaded question because there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. Like, are you an S Corp? Are you a LLC? Are you sole proprietor? Do you do design build? Are you a specialty trade? Should I be a general contractor? Uh, a lot of different stuff going on there. And I want to simplify it. And I want to use this through the, through the lens that nothing matters besides the customer experience. That is literally the only thing that matters. And to achieve ultimate customer experience, you're going to have a few baseline foundational things in your company. So first, before you can even give a customer experience, you need to have a customer. You need to find a client. And uh, don't mind the doggo. If you're watching on YouTube, we have a beautiful wired haired dog here today. This is producer Dave's dog, recently rescued. Good little lap companion. Anyways, so you need to have a customer. And where are you going to get customers? Now, reverse engineer this to where would your ideal demographic of client hang out? Where would they go first for, let's say, a renovation? So one of the first things we did here at KHP Construction was we went to all of the gatekeepers that are holding these projects that we want to perform. So that's like interior designers, architects. That could be Bedrosians, a tile store. That could be other larger sub-trades asking them who they're working for and then networking with that contractor. So the biggest thing here is just getting on the ground. Get your boots on the ground, go network, go talk to industry professionals because you need clients. And by clients, I do not mean your mother-in-law fixing her fence. True story. I am not talking family and friends. I am talking people that are willing to pay you what you're worth for the service you want to offer. So that's the first step. Go out there, network, find the gatekeepers and bring value to them, solve a problem for them, and then follow through. So the second thing, and once again, this is through a customer experience lens, and this is going to sound a little selfish, charge what you're worth. And what you're worth isn't necessarily the hourly rate that you're making right now. So you might be in the field for another contractor. You might be making 35, 40 bucks an hour. You might have a 401k. You might have health insurance. Oh, bye doggo. Doggo's out of here. But that is not what it costs to run a business. So you need to have a very clear grasp on what it's going to cost to operate the business that you want to build. And so this client experience is built around the overhead. So in six months from now, in 12 months, in 18 months, 24 months, what does your business look like? And then reverse engineering that to a day rate where you stand day one. So what we did here at KHP Construction is we built out a five-year, three-year, one-year picture of what our company is going to look like to provide the best client experience in our market and completely dominate everyone else when it comes to client relationship. Now, what that looked like was a production manager. It looked like a project manager. It looked like a superintendent. It looked like having very highly skilled, well-paid men in the field. It looked like having a sales team, someone to answer the phone and pre-qualify. It looked like an admin to do creative design. It looked like a marketing team to get our message out there, which is how we're filming this podcast right now. Now, every single one of those positions has a dollar figure on its head. And every one of those positions needs some sort of process around them, whether that be a tech stack like a CRM um, or a project management tool like Builder Trend, what we use, and all those have a cost as well. So you take all the costs and you build it up, you divide it over working days, and it gives you a rough day rate of what your fixed cost to operate is going to look like. Now, you also have to add in vehicles, insurance, uh, workers' comp. You're going to have to add in taxes, that was a big eye opener. Our first year was taxes. All of these things go down to a day rate, and that is going to be your fixed cost to operate every single day. Now, a good rule of thumb we used when we first started out 240 working days. We divided our total overhead for the year by 240, and that's how we got that initial day rate. Now, next up is going to be the cost of goods sold. Now, there's a above the line costs and below the line costs. So when we talk about below the line here, that's going to be an overhead cost. That's a fixed cost, what we just talked about here. We talk about above the line, that is all the variable expenses for the project, i.e. labor, material. So this is going to be the direct cost to a project and it's only going to be spent on that project. 
So that could be the lumber going in to frame the addition, could be the cabinet cost, the stone, it could be the hourly wage of your man or woman in the field performing that work. Now, this is going to vary um, project to project, depending on the man hours produced, depending on the full scope of work. So don't get too caught up in the variable cost because it's going to be hard to forecast that until you know how much production you're going to get out of the networking you just did. But rule of thumb here, I would use for like a highly skilled carpenter, for example, 35 to 45 an hour, and then adding about 30 to 40% to that hourly rate to account for their taxes. Now, project managers, anywhere from 75 to 100,000 a year, sometimes more, depending on the market. Uh, superintendents, a little bit less, usually 75 to 90 a year, depending on your market. But you're going to want to have this cost directly allocated to each project you're doing. So you take your day rate, you take the man hours you're estimating in the trade partner uh, bids, you're taking the labor and all the materials, adding all that up, and you're adding that to the day rate. So you take how long this project is going to take, you add your day rate, times it by the duration, add the variable expenses. There you go. Voila. Now, profit, arguably the most important part of keeping your newly open business open. That's something you can fix into your hard costs. So you can be pricing in a profit margin. Um, this could also be in the terms of adding some sort of markup, whether you're cost plus or lump sum, a whole different podcast on that stuff. But typically we're shooting for a 10 to 15% net profit line after everything's paid for on overhead. So that is don't lose your ass. That's the biggest thing when you're starting out is there's like this golden spot for homeowners where contractors don't understand what they should charge and they're way undercutting the market here. And then they get so busy and they start running around in circles doing work for essentially free. And then they complain that like, well, I can't grow. I'm not making enough money. It's like, well, cause you're charging for where you're at. You're not charging for where you want to be. So if you want to ever have a successful contracting company, if you ever want to grow, if you ever want to have, you know, a legacy type company, you need to charge where you want to be, not where you're at and see what the market will bear. Cause these established companies are setting that market line. And unless you're really exceeding value, you're going to know we're going to fall. I forget the exact term of it, but there's like three tiers of a company. And when you're starting out, you're obviously at tier one and tier one is fulfilling the desired scope of work, but there's no excitement. There's no frills around completing the scope of work, right? There's no live schedule. There's no daily messaging. There might not be any sort of reporting system, um, any automations built around the client experience. It's just straight up showing up at seven thirty, eight o'clock, leaving at three thirty, four o'clock, knocking out the work, homeowner's happy, right? It was the expected outcome for why the homeowner hired you as a contractor to fulfill the problem that they have. You're the solution, they had a problem, you fixed it. You did the kitchen, you did the bathroom, you replaced the windows, whatever it may be. Now, tier two companies, this is when you're gonna get like five to 10 employees, I would say. Now, this is the company that meets and exceeds, so they have some frill around their, their processes, the client experience. So the client has a, a notion of how this renovation should go down, how fast windows should be installed, um, how much communication they should have on their project. And you meet all of that with either a tech stack and automation or a physical person in the field that is communicating with that person and exceeding what their notion of how this should go went. So you're delivering farther than just the end result. The end result's going to be the same as the tier one guy, but you built a little bit of a client experience around this. Now, tier three, and this is the, the kind of the pinnacle of service industry companies. This is the, the company that obviously fulfills the end goal. They, they fix the problem for the consumer. They have a client experience. They have some systems in place. They have a project management software, a CRM, probably some automations, but they also have the X factor. And the X factor here is doing something that the homeowner didn't even know they needed without them asking. And this comes to the entrepreneurial minded service businesses. These are the people that can identify their ideal customer, understand the psychographics of why they're buying your service to fix their problem and address that major desire that the homeowner didn't even know they had. And this is something that most service industries are going to be chasing for a long time. And it takes a decent amount of resources, uh, creative, uh, creativity. It takes a, a team around you, a tech stack, the whole nine yards. This is the pinnacle, giving that 
best client experience in your market, and that's how you dominate. So when I'm talking about customer experience, and again, you're a day one, year one type contractor, you're going to want to get people around you. And this is going to go to the next topic I want to talk about, and that is leveraging your strengths and hiring for your weaknesses. Now, me, for example, in KHP Construction, I'm the visionary, right? I create this big picture. I make sure my vision is big enough for everyone under us to fit inside that vision. And then my goal is to produce, right? I need to get to that vision. I need to hammer away day after day to get to that vision. Now, for yourself, you might be a a tradesman, right? You might be coming from the field, by the field, you know the craft, you're really good at your craft, and you might be horrible at communication, You need to hire for your weaknesses. So if that is you, maybe that looks like a salesperson or a CSR, a customer uh, service relationship manager type person. But hire for your weaknesses off the bat. Now, everything you do in this hiring process should be customer facing. Everything you do. So if you're the tradesman and you're knocking stuff out of the park, you have the best craftsmanship in your market, great. Stay where you're at. Stay in the field. I know this is counterintuitive because most people are like, get off the bags and get in the office and work on the business, not in the business. Your business is only as good as the product that you put out to solve people's problems. That's it. All people care about is the experience and the end result. And if you're the guy directly producing the end result and that is your specialty, stay on the bags. You do not want to get a bad reputation up front and sabotage future growth or uh, any other opportunities down the road. Hire for your weaknesses, leverage your strengths. I want to go back to charging what you're worth. And when we're talking about charging what you're worth, there's an ethical question that gets arised. Um, And this is something that we had to battle with as well. Um, You know, hey, Ryan, you're charging $1,600 a day in overhead and uh, you're working out of a 10 by 10 shop and you only have three employees. And what are you doing here? Now, when you're making that amount of money, you're going to be enticed to get some sticky fingers. You're going to get really shiny, big, bright eyes. You're going to want to buy a lot of cool stuff like a truck, right? Uh, Or a bigger shop. Don't. Do not. Take that money. Uh, I'd recommend you read Profit First for contractors. Uh, Allocate that money properly. Compartmentalize all of that money into the different departments of who's going to take that money from you, right? Uncle Sam, upcoming projects. Keep it a retained earnings account, operating account, and allocate all of the money you're making for those potential people in your company and stick to a plan. Know who you're going to hire before you even hire them. Know the position, know the salary, know the comp structure you're going to give to someone and set that money aside because you're never going to grow if you keep burning through money or you're not charging enough and you have to go into your retained earnings to cover the cost of an upcoming project. Save your money, allocate your money, and as soon as you get three months or so of someone's salary pull the trigger, go get them, go hire for your weakness. And this is kind of, I guess, the glue concept here of charging what you're worth, having a vision, hiring for your weaknesses. When do you do that? Three months of salary, go buy that person, go get that employee to complement your weakness and go right down the road and keep taking over work and doing what you're good at. Now, that's really about all I had to say on this podcast. Now, in the groups I'm in, uh, the main one being Contractor Life Academy, most of the guys are probably one to five year or they're five plus years and they're just kind of stuck where they're at. And I feel like a lot of these things come down to client experience. We didn't even touch marketing. We didn't even touch really sales. We didn't even touch fulfilling the project. I mean, those could all be future episodes, really. Because uh, none of that matters if the client doesn't have a good experience, in my opinion. Nothing matters except for what the client sees. Here at KHB Construction, we've had so many internal tiffs and battles and changes in process and egos and things going against each other and people not on the same page. It's the way it's going to go once you start growing. But those growing pains have always been behind closed doors. Nothing has touched our client experience throughout the life of our company, except for COVID in 2021. We lost half our company in like three months and that really sucked. But besides that time, nothing client facing was affected by the internal changes of growing pains. So no matter what you do, you can't go wrong if you take care of your customer. Read a book by Steve Jobs. He really dives into client experience and uh, developing a solution or a product that people don't even know they need. Be good to your customer. You're going to grow. Charge what you're worth. Save that money. Allocate it for future positions. You're going to do well. And do what you say you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. Integrity. 
All right, that's it. Thanks for watching this. Like on YouTube, follow, subscribe, share, tell a friend, and uh, we'll see you next week.